But I want to draw your attention to that Bible reading of Mark chapter 10. There's a section in there that has intrigued me, and I wanted to talk about it. We could have talked about a, a multitude of, of different topics. Uh, obviously, divorce and remarriage is in here, and there are a lot of topics that are important for us, uh, being like a little child, accepting accepting uh, uh, Jesus and what he tells us uh, in full faith and trust. We could talk about that. We could talk about Jesus uh, foretelling his death. We could talk about the sons of thunder again and their request to set one at his right hand and one at his left. But uh might have that uh, we talk about a topic of what's in a name. I want you to think about that. What is in a name? Our name is what identifies us. Whether your name is is uh, Dylan, or whether your name is Peter, or whether your name is is um, uh, Miranda, your name identifies you. It's who you are, and your name is important. Hopefully, you like your name, appreciate your name. But I want you to think about something for a moment. Have you ever rushed up to someone, knowing who they were? and greeted them only to have them stare blankly at you and say, who are you again? Growing up with uh, my grandmother, my grandmother and I were very, very close. I probably owe her uh, more than any other person alive who ever lived the, the faith that I had. And, and we, were, we were just so close. I would call her. She would call me. You know, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother. But as she began to age, she had dementia. And there were times when I was a young adult, about 20, 23 years old, where I would go up after church and I would wrap the, this little lady who stood about this tall in a, in a hug. And I would say, good morning, Grandma. I love you. And she would look back at me and she would say, I know I'm supposed to know you, but I can't think of who you are. You know, and there were days where, who are you again? It was exactly what came out of her mouth. You know, there are times that I have also gone up and I've greeted people who I knew in places like Lowe's or Walmart. And they've said, now, who are you again? You know, and, and maybe it's just because I'm, I'm a, I view myself as kind of a friendly person. But, and, and many times they do know who I am, but sometimes they don't. Our reaction may be to that, who are you again, could be embarrassing. Sometimes that's embarrassing when you know somebody and you think they should know you, or somebody knows you and you should know them. Sometimes that's an embarrassing moment. To admit that you don't know who they are. Sometimes it's disappointment. You know, there's a sense of, really, you don't remember me? And sometimes there's occasionally, especially with my grandmother, there was that desperate urge to make her remember who I was and a sense of loss that she could not remember or bring to recall who I was. On the other hand, there's nothing like greeting a beloved friend, seeing someone smile at recognition, and giving you a warm hug. There's nothing like that closeness of two people who really, truly know each other. There's nothing like it. You know, we, I, we, don't, we don't maybe hug like we used to. You know, COVID came around and everybody's like six feet apart. You know, but I'm telling you that when I, was, when I was young, one of the things that I really enjoyed was going to see family members. My grandmother had a huge amount of cousins and Alita and I were just talking about a couple of them from uh, Pleasant Valley this morning, Bill and Dorothy Long. And, you know, every time I saw Dorothy, you know, there was a big family hug thing that went on. That warm greeting, recognizing someone who is close to you. 
I want to introduce you today to a character that we noticed in, in the Bible. Actually, I want to introduce you to a couple characters. The first character comes from Luke chapter 16, verse 19. We know him as a rich man and Lazarus. The rich man in that account has no name. He is simply called the rich man. We're not going to spend a lot of time there, but I just wanted to bring him out as a point of interest. And he has no name given in the Bible. The second character comes from today's lesson down in verse 17. This man is referred to, depending on whether you're in Mark's gospel or whether you're in Matthew's gospel, either as a young man or a young ruler or as a rich young ruler. I think Matthew refers to him as a rich young ruler in Matthew's gospel. But nevertheless, he has no name. Wouldn't that be odd for someone not to have a name? I guarantee you that this young man had a name. Now, as I said, I want to focus most of our attention on this rich young ruler. It's quite easy for us to look at, the, at Lazarus and the rich man who was with him, and we can see the rich man's faults and failings. Okay, he, he was he was kind of uh, indifferent to Lazarus' sufferings, and so when they both died, it seems justified that Lazarus is is in Abraham's bosom, resting peacefully, and the rich man is in torment. That seems like justice to us, the way we look at things. But today, I want you to look at this rich man that we just read about in our Bible reading. And I'm going to read this section from our scripture reading again. And he was, and as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and now before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now I'll pause right there for a moment. We can notice a couple of things from this passage. First of all, we notice his sincerity. Unlike what Mark records for us at the beginning of, of this chapter, talking about the Pharisees, it says in verse 2, the Pharisees came up in order to test him. They weren't interested in knowing the truth. The Pharisees already, they're the type of people they've already got it figured out. There's nothing new they can learn from Jesus, but they're out there to test him. They want to lay a trap for Jesus. Their intent was maliciousness. This young man, we can see his sincerity. Unlike the scribes and Pharisees, he wants an honest and truthful answer. And I think what we see this is that we see it in that he ran, he runs. We see his eagerness and enthusiasm that you don't notice in scribes and Pharisees. We also see that he kneels before Jesus. He calls him good teacher. I think these are all indications that this young man is eager. I, you know what? I love young people when they're eager. I love young people when they're sincere and excited to know about Jesus or to know what Jesus' answer is to something going on in their life. One of the, one of the greatest moments of, of my life has been when a young person comes up who wants a sincere answer and is willing to dig into the Bible to find it. I spent a lot of time studying with a young man who was sadly going through a divorce at a very early age. And he said, I want to know the truth about what the Bible teaches. And Brad and I spent hours opening the Bible, looking at various passages, talking about what Jesus said about that issue. And I love that eagerness and enthusiasm. We kind of see that here with this young man. Now, I want you to also notice, if we read a little bit further down through here, he wants to know what it is that he has to do in, in order to inherit eternal life. Verse 18, we see Jesus' response. <clears throat> and Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? 
No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Okay, this is impressive. Because the young man says, Teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. Well, I don't know too many people who could honestly say that. But I believe this young man is being sincere. Jesus refers to him to the law of Moses. You want to inherit eternal life? Follow the law of Moses. He gives them the, the, basically the Ten Commandments here. Even right down to saying, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. I believe that this young ruler probably believed that Jesus was the Messiah. That Jesus was God. And he tells him all of these things. Now, I don't know about you. Now, I, I, I've never killed anybody, thankfully. I've never committed adultery. You know, there's some of those others down through there, you know, uh, bearing false witness, defrauding. Oh, how about honoring your father and mother? How many of us could honestly say that we have honored our father and mother completely? I think if we're honest with ourselves, at some point or another, we've been disrespectful. I know I was. There is no doubt in my mind. And if you want to, you can go ask my parents. I'm sure they have enough honesty in them to tell you that I was disrespectful. My mother one time said, I hope I ne I was the oldest of eight. My mother one time said, I never want to have another teenager. She had seven more teenagers after I went through. And I am glad to say that I don't think that I was her worst nightmare. But nevertheless, I was not a perfect person. I could not have said that I kept these from my youth. But this young man did. All of these are, are fabulous qualities. I cannot, I cannot extol the qualities that this young guy has enough. But you know, the, the truth is, yeah, I'm looking out here and I'm thinking, oh boy, we are way outnumbered with young people today. And there are young people here in which I see these qualities. I see these qualities in you guys. Maybe you're not perfect, but you have these good qualities and characteristics. I want you to notice something. When this young man responds, Mark says in verse 21, and Jesus, looking at him, loved him. It is so easy to love somebody with good qualities. But you see, God looks at the heart. It's not just these external qualities that Jesus is seeing. Jesus is seeing a guy whose heart is in the right place. And he loves him because his heart is right. This young man, if we go to Matthew's gospel, I'm not going to go back there, but the parallel passage, Matthew records this in Matthew 19 20. Matthew's gospel records a little bit differently. The young man in Matthew's gospel asks a question. What, I, what do I still lack? I think it's the way it's worded. I think I've got a typo on the screen. Um, your King James Version will render it, what lack I yet? Okay, this young man knew there's still something missing in his life. He's honest enough with himself to know, I'm not perfect. I've got all these qualities. I've kept the Old Testament law. But he's good enough to know that he's not perfect. What this young man lacked was a personal, a very personal relationship with Jesus. He's on the verge. He's on the verge of this very personal relationship with Jesus. And he also lacks obedience to Jesus. A willingness to yield 
to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 20, Jesus said, if you would be perfect. Luke says, you lack one thing. There's one little item missing in this young man's life. What is it? Jesus says, go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Now there's a very sad ending to this. And you know what? I don't mean to, I, 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 I hate sermons like this with sad endings. I like happy endings. But this is a reality. I can't count on both hands and probably both feet the number of young people that I've had in Bible class who have gone away sad, left the church disappointed because there's something that they're not willing to give up. They're not willing to yield to Jesus. They're not willing to follow Jesus because, see this young man, he came to Jesus. He had a willingness to follow Jesus. He just wasn't ready mentally and emotionally and spiritually. He wasn't ready for what Jesus saw that was holding him back. There's one thing in his life that's more important to him than Jesus. Now, we may not have money. But is there one thing? Ask yourself this. Is there one thing in your life? Or is there a multitude of things that might be holding us back from following Jesus like we should? This is a question I've wrestled with myself. Recently, well, in the last couple of years, I was approached by a couple of different families from different states, Alabama being one of them. Would you consider coming to Alabama? No. My initial reaction, no, I'm not going to Alabama. I'm not moving to Alabama. I like where I'm at. And I've had to ask myself, is, is that my weakness? Is there something that I am, I am more attached to the Mid-Ohio Valley mud than I am to Jesus? This young man was more attached to something else than Jesus. I want to go back here to Matthew chapter 10 for a moment. And I want you to see something here. In Matthew chapter 10 and in verse 33. Matthew 10, 33, but whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. What this young man does at the end of this story, this account, is to go away sad, to deny Jesus the right into his life. Do you ever wonder why this man has no name? Do you ever wonder why the rich man in Luke chapter 16 has no name? I want to introduce you to an idea that neither of these men are named because God does not know them. They come up to God and he has no knowledge of who they are. They never knew God. This rich young man had something in his life that was keeping him from knowing God on a very personal level. 
building a relationship with Jesus through obedience to what Jesus required of him. Kept him from having a, from really knowing Jesus. It's kind of like the President of the United States. We know who he is, but we don't have a knowledge of him. We don't really know him. I don't have a personal relationship with the President of the United States. And so if I were to go up to if I were to go up to the president and I were to shake his hand and say, Hello, sir, it's it, I, do you remember me? He'd say, No. I don't know who you are. Because I don't know him and he does not know me. Look here at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. The Apostle Paul says that one of the most important things in a Christian's life is to know God. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 3. Paul is talking about idols. How an idol has no power over an individual who knows God. He says, But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. If anyone loves God, he is known by God. In other words, if I love God, God knows me. I am not just a descriptive nature. The Bible assigned this young man a description. A rich, young ruler. The Bible does not assign him a name. Because he is not known by God. Because he loved something else more than Jesus. Every person going to heaven is in a relationship with God. Through obedience to what God asks of us. Now God has not asked of us what the rich young ruler was required. What if, what if God clearly stated, as he does, let's, let's, let's look for just a moment. This is what God requires of us. Mark chapter 16, we're almost there in our Bible readings. Mark chapter 16, what does God require of us? Does he require us to sell everything that we own and give it to the poor? No. No, I don't believe he does. He says in verse 15, he said to them, to his disciples, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel, the good news, to, er to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. You see, that's, that's what Jesus requires of us. What if someone were to look at Jesus and go away sad because because they don't want to get wet. Does that happen? I can tell you seriously it does. It does happen. But when we build that relationship with Jesus, according to being willing to do what he asks of us, Jesus knows us and we know him. When Jesus sent out 72 evangelists to preach the gospel, in Luke's, in, in Luke's account, chapter 10, they return and they're excited. I'm telling you, these guys are so wound up. Jesus has sent out 72. They come back. Satan is, is subject to us. The devils go out. They're so excited. They have done so much for Jesus. And in Luke chapter 10, they're telling Jesus about this. Verse 17, the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Jesus said, I saw him. You cast him down. He fell like lightning. 
Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions over the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. But look at verse 20 with me. This is the kicker. He says, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Having one's name written in heaven means that Jesus knows who we are. That he recognizes us as his disciples as his followers. In Revelation chapter 12, 20 and verse 12, we read about a book of life. When Jesus told the 72 that their names were written in heaven, he is referring to this book of life. The book of life is first mentioned in the Bible, as far as I could find it, in the book of Exodus. From Exodus to Revelation, everyone who has been saved Every child of God has their name recorded in the book of life. In Revelation 20 and verse 12, John says, And I saw the dead small and great stand before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And see, and, de and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead with, who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. You see how important it is to have your name. We sang the song, is my name written there on the page white and fair in the book of thy kingdom? Is my name written there? It's more important to have our name written in the book of life and we should rejoice to have our name written in the book of life more than we should rejoice overcoming Satan. More than we should rejoice about overcoming trials and temptations we should rejoice having our name written in the book of life those who die in Christ are written or will be judged by what is written based on how we live here on the earth if a person's name is not written in that book of life they do not even have a chance we would maybe use the expression, they don't even have a prayer. You see, the way I read this, those who are not written in the book of life will never even have the opportunity to stand before the judgment seat. Their doom is already sealed. Their place of destination is sure. It is only those whose names are written in the book of life who will have the opportunity to stand before God in judgment. And you know what? When I stand before God in judgment, I will be condemned but for one thing. But for one thing I will be condemned. I will be condemned except for the blood of Christ. The blood that covers my sins. The blood that allows me to have that relationship with Jesus. In Matthew chapter 7, there's a group of people gathered together. And Jesus tells this, Matthew chapter 7, and in verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. We can go up and we can greet the President of the United States, but he may not know us. At the end of time, we may go up and we may greet God, but he may not know us. Jesus says, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. 
It's not because Jesus is going to have Alzheimer's. It's because these people never took the time, the initiative to build a relationship with Jesus. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of lawlessness. I have one closing thought today, and that comes from the 101st Psalm. I'd like to go back there for a moment and read that. Psalm 101 is a very short psalm, so I would like for us to look at the entire psalm. I would like to read that and just have you think about it. It's a psalm of David, a man after God's own heart. David says, I will sing this, said, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord. Or, sorry. I will sing of the steadfast love and justice to you, O Lord. I will make music. I will ponder the way that is blameless. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. I will not set my eyes on anything that is worthless. I hate the works of those who fall away. They shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. Whatever slant Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. I will look for favor, with favor on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Morning by morning I will destroy all the wicked in the land, cutting off all the evildoers from the house of the Lord. You see, it's not that God is heartless. God simply doesn't know those who do not know him. At the end of the day, the only thing that we need to do is to build a relationship with God. A relationship that is, well, we can't have a relationship with someone we don't know even exists. We know that God exists by hearing his word. And we believe his word. We believe in the Jesus that we read about in the Bible. We realize that we're imperfect just like the rich young ruler realized his imperfections. And he came to Jesus. But you know what that rich young ruler didn't do? He didn't follow Jesus. Jesus says, whoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. And lastly, as we looked at, Jesus requires us to be baptized. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes God shall be condemned. It's not rocket science. It's not difficult unless we're too attached to something besides Jesus. What might be standing in our way? Here today, and we can help you in any way. I would encourage you to make your wants and wishes known as we sing 312.